passed by Peter Jennings. It goes to the governor. Good evening, Mr. Vice President. Governor. Peter. Governor, one theme that, theme that keeps coming up about the way you govern, you've both mentioned leadership tonight, so I'd like to stay with that for a second. The theme that keeps coming up about the way you govern is passionless, technocratic. Passionless? Passionless, technocratic, the smartest clerk in the world. Your critics maintain that in the 1960s, your public passion was not the war in Vietnam or civil rights, but no-fault auto insurance. And they say that in the 1970s, you played virtually no role in the painful busing crisis in Boston. Given the fact that a president must sometimes lead by sheer inspiration and passion, we need to know if this is a fair portrait of your governing, or is it a stereotype? And if it isn't fair, do you give us an example of where you have had that passion and leadership that sometimes a president needs? Peter, I care deeply about people, all people, working people, working families, uh, people all over this country who, in some cases, are living from paycheck to paycheck, in other cases, are having a hard time opening up the door of college opportunity to their children, in other cases, uh, don't have basic health insurance, which, for most of us, uh, we accept as a matter of course and assume we're going to have in order to pay the bills that we incur when we get sick. I'm somebody who believes deeply in genuine opportunity for every single citizen in this country, and that's the kind of passion I brought to my state. I was a leader in the civil rights movement in my state and in my legislature. I cared very deeply about that war in Vietnam. I thought it was a mistake. I thought it was wrong. And I was one of the few legislators early in that war that uh, took a stand against the war. I think it was the right stand at the time, and I think history has proved us to be correct. Uh, but I have learned over time. Uh, I served one term. I was defeated, as you know, and defeat sometimes is an important lesson. I think I'm a much better governor today. I think I'm a much better person, a much better listener. I think I'll be a much better president for having gone through that experience. But the things that we have done in my state to bring opportunity to people on public assistance, over 50,000 families on welfare that we've helped to move from welfare to work and to be, become productive citizens, the universal health care bill that we just talked about, which will guarantee health care for all of our citizens. The opening up of opportunity to minorities in my state, uh, affirmative action, uh, minority contracting, uh, the fact that we have a 3% unemployment rate and more jobs and people to fill them, which uh, gives us a tremendous opportunity to reach out to everybody and make them a part of this wonderful nation of ours and the opportunity that we create. These are things that I believe in uh, very, very deeply. Uh, I may be a little calmer than some about it. It may be a greater consensus builder these days than I used to be, and I think that's a good thing. But I'm running for the presidency of the United States. I've been in public service for 25 years because I believe deeply in American goals and values and in the people of this country, and that's the kind of president I want to be. Mr. Vice President, a rebuttal? Well, I don't question his passion. Uh, I question, and I don't question his concern about the war in Vietnam. He introduced or supported legislation back then that suggested that kids from Massachusetts should be exempt from going overseas in that war. Now, that's a certain passion, but in my view, it's misguided passion. Uh, he, we have a big difference on issues. You see, last year in the primary, he expressed his passion. He said, I am a strong liberal Democrat, August 87. Then he said, I am a card-carrying member of the ACLU. That was what he said. He is out there on out of the mainstream. He is very passionate. My argument with the governor is, do we want this country to go that far left? And I wish we had time to let me explain, but I salute him for his passion. We just have a big difference on where this country should be led and in what direction it ought to go. Peter, Peter a question, question for the Vice President, Peter. I'd actually like to follow up, if I may, on this, uh, on this mention you've made of uh, this card-carrying membership in the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, you've used the phrase card-carrying so many times since Governor Dukakis first acknowledged that he was a card-carrying member of the ACLU <laughs> that some people uh, some people have come to believe that you've used it in, to brand him in some way, to identify him as people were identified in the 1950s as less than patriotic. I'd like to know why you keep repeating the phrase, 
what's the important issue yeah. here? What is so wrong with the governor being a member of an organization which has come to the defense of, among other people, Colonel Oliver North? Nothing's wrong with it. But just take a look at the positions of the, just take a look at the positions of the ACLU. But Peter, please understand, the liberals do not like me talking about liberal. They don't like it when I say that he says he's a card-carrying member. Now, if that quote was wrong, he can repudiate it right here. I've seen it authoritatively written twice. And if I've done him an injustice and he didn't say it, I'm very, very sorry. But I don't agree with a lot of the, most of the positions of the ACLU. I simply don't want to see the ratings on movies. I don't want my 10-year-old grandchild to go into a X-rated movie. I'd like those rating systems. I don't think they're right to try to take the tax exemption away from the Catholic Church. I don't want to see the kiddie uh, pornographic laws repealed. I don't want to see under God come out from our currency. Now, these are all positions of the ACLU, and I don't agree with them. He has every right to exercise his passion as what he said, a strong progressive liberal. I don't agree with that. I come from a very different point of view, and I think I'm more in touch with the, uh, the uh, mainstream of America. They raised the same thing with me on the Pledge of Allegiance. You see, I, I'd have found a way to sign that bill. Governor Thompson of Illinois did. I'm not questioning his patriotism. He goes out and says, man is questioning my patriotism. And then all the liberal columnists join in. I am not. I am questioning his judgment on these matters or where he's coming from. He has every right to do it. But I believe that's not what the American people want. And when he said, when he said at the convention, ideology doesn't matter, just competence, he was moving away from his own record, from what his passion has been over the years. And that's all I'm trying to do is put it in focus. And I hope people don't think that I am questioning his uh, patriotism when I say he used his words to describe his, his uh, participation in that organization. Governor, to response? Well, I hope this is the first and last time I have to say this. Of course the Vice President is questioning my patriotism. I don't think there's any question about that. And I resent it. I resent it. My parents came to this country as immigrants. They taught me that this was the greatest country in the world. I'm in public service because I love this country. I believe in it. And nobody's going to question my patriotism as the Vice President has now repeatedly. The fact of the matter is that if the Pledge of Allegiance was the acid test of one's patriotism. Vice President's been the presiding officer in the United States Senate for the past seven and a half years. To the best of my knowledge, he's never once suggested that the session of the Senate begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I don't... <laughs> Mr. Bush, I don't question your patriotism. When you're attacked for your military record, I immediately said that it was inappropriate, it had no place in this campaign, and. I rejected it, and uh, I would hope that from this point on we get to the issues that affect the vast majority of Americans, jobs, schools, health care, housing, the environment. Those are the concerns of the people that are watching us tonight, uh, we, not labels that we attach to each other, and questions about each other's patriotism and loyalty. Time is up. Uh, Governor, let's go now to John Mashik again. Question for the Vice President. Mr. Vice President, in a debate during the Republican primaries, you said most of the nation's homeless are suffering from mental illness, an assertion immediately challenged by one of your rivals. Estimates of the homeless range from a low of 250,000 by the government to around 3 million, including working families and their children. What commitment are you willing to make tonight to this voiceless segment of our society? I want to see the McKinney Act fully funded. Uh, I believe that that would help in terms of shelter. I want to see, when I talked at our, at our convention about a thousand points of light, I was talking about the enormous numbers of shelters and organizations that help. The governor's wife has been very active in the homeless. My, my campaign chairman, Secretary Jim Baker's wife. This isn't government. These are people that care, that are trying to give of themselves. The government has a role. It is to fully fund the McKinney Act. There are certain army bases that the act calls for that can be used in certain cases to shelter people when it's rough. 
And so I think that we're on the right track. I don't see this incidentally as a Democrat or Republican or a liberal or conservative idea. I see an involvement by a thousand points of light. I see the funding that is required and I hope the Congress will fully fund this bill. They gave it a great deal of conscience and a great deal of work and uh, we're on the right track on this one. But, uh, and I, look, mental, that was a little overstated it. I'd say around 30%. And I think maybe we could look back over our shoulders and wonder whether it was right to uh, let all those mental patients out. Maybe we need to do a better job in mental clinics to help, uh, help them, because there is a major problem there. A lot of them are mentally sick. We've got to attend to them. But fully, my, my short range answer is fully fund that McKinney Act. Governor, a response? Well, this is another fundamental difference that I have in, with the Vice President just as I do in the case of health care for 37 million members of working families in this country uh, who don't have health insurance. The problem, Mr. Bush, is that you've cut back by 90% on our commitment to affordable housing for families of low and moderate income. And when you do that, you have homeless families. We didn't have two and a half million or three million homeless people living on streets and in doorways in this country 10 years ago. We've got to begin to get back to the business of building and rehabilitating housing for families of low and moderate income in this country. Housing for young families that they can look forward someday to buy. We've got communities in this country increasingly where our own kids can't afford to live and the communities that they grew up in. That's an essential commitment, and I think the housing community is ready. But it's going to take a president who's committed to housing, who's had experience in building and rehabilitating housing, who understands that affordable housing for families of low and moderate income, for young families, first-time home buyers, is an essential part of the American dream. And while I'm all for the McKinney bill, that by itself simply won't do. We've got to have a president that can lead on this issue, that can work with the Congress, and I'm prepared to do so. This is one of the most important priorities that faces this country. John, a question for the governor. Uh, governor, you've mentioned the uh, American dream of home ownership, and it's certainly become an impossible one for many of the young people of our nation who are caught up in this economic squeeze of the middle class, as you've said so frequently during the campaign. And yet, in spite of your uh, answer just a few minutes ago, what promise can you realistically hold out to these people that uh, with the costs of housing going up and with limited help available from Washington, are we destined to become a nation of renters? Well, I certainly hope not, and it's all a question of what our priorities are. Bush talked about values. I agree with him. What are our values? Isn't providing housing for families of low and moderate income, isn't it making possible for young families, first-time home buyers to own their own home someday, uh, something that's part of the American dream? I think so. You know, back after World War II, when we had hundreds of thousands of GIs who came back from the war, we didn't sit around. We went out and built housing. The government was very much involved. So was the housing industry. So was the banking industry. So were housing advocates. So were nonprofit agencies. So were governors and mayors and people all over this country who believe deeply in home ownership and affordable housing. Now, that's the kind of leadership that I want to provide as President of the United States. This isn't a question of, of a little charity for the homeless. This is a question of organizing the housing community. I've talked to bankers and builders and developers, to housing advocates, advocates, to community development agencies, and they want leadership from Washington. Washington by itself can't do it all. We shouldn't expect that. But governors are ready, mayors are ready, builders and uh, community leaders are ready. It will require some funds, John. And uh, we ought to be prepared to provide those funds. But that, true, too, will, will require some choices. Uh, Mr. Bush wants to spend billions and trillions on Star Wars. Well, that's a choice we have to make, isn't it? Do we spend money on that weapon system in the billions and trillions? Or is providing some decent and affordable housing for families of this country something that isn't at least as important and probably more so? Because uh, it's so essential to our economic strength and to our future. Uh, that's the kind of pres presidency I believe in. And uh, simply to say, well, the McKinney bill will do it, uh, just doesn't do. We need a president who will lead on this issue, who's had experience on this issue. Uh, it's the kind of priority that will be at the top of our list beginning in January of 1989. A response, Mr. Vice President. I think the governor is blurring housing and the homeless. Let's talk about housing, which the question was. Uh, when you talk to those bankers, did they discuss where interest rates were when your party controlled the White House? Ten days before I took the oath of office as president, they were 21.5%. Now, how does that grab you for increasing housing? Housing is up. 
We are serving a million more families now, but we're not going to do it. And that old democratic liberal way of trying to build more bricks and mortars, go out and take a look at St. Louis at some of that effort. It is wrong. I favor home ownership. I want to see more vouchers. I want to see tenant control of some of these projects. And I want to keep the interest rates down. They're half now of what they were when we came into office. And with my policy of getting this deficit under control, they'll be a lot less. But if we spend and spend and spend, that is going to wrap up the housing market and we'll go right back to the days of the misery index and malaise that President Reagan and I have overcome. Thank God for the United States on that one. All right, the next question is to the governor and Grower will ask it. Governor Dukakis, is there a conflict between your opposition to the death penalty and your support for abortion on demand, even though in the minds of many people that's also killing? No, I don't think there is. There are two very different issues here, and they've got to be dealt with separately. I'm opposed to the death penalty. I think everybody knows that. I'm also very tough on violent crime. And, <laughs> and that's one of the reasons why my state has cut crime by more than any other industrial state in America. It's one of the reasons why we have the lowest murder rate of any industrial state in the country. It's one of the reasons why we have a drug education and prevention program that is reaching out and helping youngsters all over our state. The kind of thing I want to do as, as President of the United States. You know, the Vice President says he wants to impose the death penalty on drug traffickers, and yet his administration has a federal furlough program which uh, is one of the most uh, permissive in the country and which gave last year 7,000 furloughs to drug traffickers and drug pushers, the same people that he says he now wants to execute. Uh, the issue of abortion is a very difficult issue, uh, one that I think we all have to wrestle with, uh, we have to come to terms with. I don't favor abortion. I don't think it's a good thing. I don't think most people do. The question is, who makes the decision? And I think it has to be the woman in the exercise of her own conscience and religious beliefs that makes that decision. Response, Mr. Vice President. Well, the Massachusetts furlough program was unique. It was the only one in the nation that furloughed murderers who had not served enough time to be eligible for parole. The federal program doesn't do that. No other state programs do that. And, therefore, and I, I favor the death penalty. I know it's tough and honest people can disagree, but when a when a narcotics wrapped up guy goes in and murders a police officer, I think they ought to pay with their life. And I do believe it would be inhibiting. And so I am not going to furlough men like Willie Horton, and I would meet with their, the victims of his last escapade, the rape and the brutalization of the family down there in Maryland. Maryland would not extradite Willie Horton, the man who was furloughed, the murderer, because they didn't want him to be furloughed again. And so we have a fundamental difference on this one, and I think most people know my position on the sanctity of life. I favor adoption. I do not favor abortion. Question for the Vice President, Ann. Yes. Uh, Mr. Vice President, I'd like to, to stay with uh, abortion for just a moment, if I might. Over the years, you have expressed several positions uh, while opposing nearly all forms of government payment for it. You now say that you support abortion only in cases of rape incest or threat to a mother's life and you also support a constitutional amendment that if ratified would outlaw most abortions but if abortions were to become illegal again do you think that the women who defy the law and have them anyway as they did before it was okayed by the supreme court and the doctors who performed them should go to jail i i haven't sorted out the penalties but i do know i do know that i oppose abortion and I favor adoption. And we can, if we can get this law changed, we, everybody should make the extraordinary effort to take these kids that are unwanted and sometimes aborted, take the, take the let them come to, come to a birth, and then put them in a family where there'll be love. And you see, I, yes, I, my position has evolved, and it's continuing to evolve. And it's evolving in favor of life. And I have had a couple of exceptions that I support. Rape, incest, and the life of the mother. Sometimes people feel a little uncomfortable talking about this. But it's much clearer for me now. As I've seen abortion sometimes used as a 
birth control device, for heaven's sakes? See the millions of these killings uh, uh, cu accumulate. And this is one where you can have an honest difference of opinion. We certainly do. But no, I'm for the, uh, the sanctity of life. And once that illegality is established, uh, then we can come to grips with the penalty side. And of course there's got to be some penalties to enforce, uh, enforce the law, whatever they may be. Governor? Well, I think what the Vice President is saying is that he's prepared to brand a woman a criminal for making this decision. As simple as that, uh, I don't think it's enough to come before the American people who are watching us tonight and say, well, I haven't sorted it out. This is a very, very difficult and a fundamental decision that all of us have to make. And what he is saying, if I understand him correctly, is that he's prepared to brand a woman a criminal for making this choice. I just said if I think the law that's, No, let me finish. Please. Yeah, sure. Uh, let me simply say that I think it has to be the woman in the exercise of her own conscience and religious beliefs that makes that decision. And I think that's the right approach, the right decision, and I would hope by this time that Mr. Bush had sorted out this issue and come to terms with it, as I have. I respect his right to disagree with me, but I think it's important that we have a position, that we take it, and we state it to the American people. Peter Jennings, a question for the Vice President. Mr. Vice President, I'm struck by your... Uh your discussion of women and the sanctity of life, and it leads me to, uh, to recall your own phrase, that you are haunted by the lives which children in our inner cities live. And certainly the evidence is compelling. There's an explosion of single parent families. And by any measure, these single parent families, many with unwanted children, are the source of poverty, school dropouts, crime, which many people in the inner city simply feel is out of control. If it haunts you so, why over the eight years of the Reagan-Bush administration have so many programs designed to help the inner city has been eliminated or cut? One of the reasons, and I first would like to know which programs you're talking about, and then we could talk on the merits of the programs. But you see, my fundamental philosophy is give local and state government as much control as possible. That may be the explanation if you tell me the program. I do strongly support the WIC program. I think it is good. I think part of the answer to this haunting of these children that are, that are out there and suffering uh, is lies in extension of Medicaid to challenge the states and maybe, maybe we're gonna have to enforce more uh, on the states in terms of uh, Medicaid taking care of these. But, but Peter, so much of it is, gets into a whole other phase of things. The neighborhood, the kind of environment people are growing up in, and that leads me to the programs I'm talking about in terms of education. I think part of it is the crime-infested neighborhoods, and that's why I'm a strong believer in, in uh, trying to control crimes in the neighborhood, why I was so pleased to be endorsed by the policemen on the beat, the Boston Police Department the other day. I think they understand my commitment to helping them in the neighborhoods. And so it's a combination of these things, but do not erode out of the system the thousand points of light. The people that are out there trying to help these kids, the programs like Cities and Schools, the work that Barbara Bush is doing so people can learn to read in this country and then go on and get break this cycle of poverty. I'm for Head Start and moving that up and I've already made a proposal and yes, it'll cost some money, but I favor that. So these are the combination of things I want, and the fact that I don't think the federal government can endorse a $35 billion program does not mean I have less compassion than the person who endorses such a program. Governor? Well, I must have been living through a different eight years from the one that the Vice President's been living through because this administration has cut and slashed and cut and slashed programs for children, for nutrition, or the kinds of things that can help these youngsters to live better lives. Has cut federal aid education, has cut Pell grants and loans to close the door to college opportunity on youngsters all over this country. And that too is a major difference between the Vice President and me. Let me just give you one other example. Uh, we have a great many people, hundreds of thousands of people living on public assistance in this country. The 50 governors of this nation have proposed to the Congress that we help those families to get off of welfare, help those youngsters, help their mothers become independent and self-sufficient. It's taken months and months and months to get Mr. Bush and the administration to support that legislation, and they're still resisting. Now, that's the way you help people. Being haunted, a thousand points of light, I don't know what that means. I know what, 
I know what strong political leadership is. I know what's happened over the course of the past eight years. These programs have been cut and slashed and butchered, and they've hurt kids all over this country. A question uh, for the governor, Peter. Governor, the crisis is no less uh, a crisis for you if you were elected president. Where would you get the money to devote to the inner cities, which is clearly needed? And can you be specific about the programs not only you'd reinstate, but the more imaginative ones that you'd begin? Well, I said a few minutes ago, Peter, that you can improve the lives of families and youngsters and save money at the same time. Welfare reform is one way to do it. If we invest in job training, in child care for those youngsters, in some extended health benefits so that that mother and her kids don't lose their health benefits when she goes to work, we can help literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of families, to get off of welfare, to become independent and self-sufficient, to be tax-paying citizens, and to improve their lives, the quality of lives, their futures, and the futures of those children. That's just one example of how you can save money and improve the quality of life at the same time. Uh, in my own state, for example, uh, we now have that universal health care system, which the vice president opposes, I think, very unwisely. One of the greatest barriers to opportunity for a family and for those children is the threat that they may lose their health insurance. Think about that father down there in Houston who has to tell his youngster that he can't play little league ball, that he can't go out on that ball field because he's afraid he's going to get hurt. And yet, Mr. Bush says, well, uh, I don't think we ought to expect businesses to provide health insurance for their employees when responsible employers, uh, a majority of employers in this country do, and are paying more for their insurance to reimburse hospitals for free care on account of people that are not, employed, un that are not insured that, that have to go to that hospital. So these are the ways that uh, you help families, you help youngsters to live better lives and more decent lives. And we're ready to go to work at the state and local level, all of us. I know the private sector is. People are all over the country. But it takes presidential leadership. It takes a commitment to being involved and to leading. And that's the kind of presidency I want to lead. Mr. Vice President? What troubles me is that when I talk of the voluntary sector and a thousand points of light and a thousand different ways to help on these problems, the man has just said he doesn't understand what I'm talking about. And this is the problem I have with the big spending liberals. They think the only way to do it is for the federal government to do it all. The fact happens to be that education spending is up by the federal government. It is up, it is not down. The federal, but here's the point he misses. The federal government spends 7% of the total money on education and the rest of the state governments and local governments and the thousand points of light, and I'm talking about private schools and private church schools and things of this nature, are putting up 93%. But the federal spending for education is up. And I want to be the education president because I want to see us do better. We're putting more money per child into education and we are not performing as we should. We've gotten away from the values and the fundamentals. And I would like to urge the school superintendents and the others around the country uh, to stand up now and keep us moving forward on a path towards real excellence. And we can do it, but it's not gonna be dictated by some Mr. federal bureaucracy in Washington, D.C. All right, let's move now to some questions on foreign and national security policy. John Mashik will ask the first question of the governor. Governor, the vice president continually refers to your lack of experience, weakness, naivete on foreign policy and national security matters. He says you are prepared to eliminate weapon systems that will result in the unilateral disarmament of this country. Is that true? Of course not. Of course, that's a charge that's always made against any governor who runs for the presidency. I think it was one of the things Mr. Bush said about Mr. Reagan back in 1980. Remember that, George? And yet some of our finest presidents, some of our strongest international leaders were governors. Franklin Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, Theodore Roosevelt. It's not the amount of time you spend in Washington. It's not the length of your resume. It's your strength. It's your values. It's the quality of the people you pick. It's your understanding of the forces of change that are sweeping the world and whether or not you're in a position to provide leadership to make those forces of change work for us and not against us. The Vice President has a long resume, but it didn't stop him from endorsing the sale of arms to the Ayatollah, 
And we now know that he was not out of the loop. He was in meeting after meeting after meeting, listening to Secretary Schultz and Secretary Weinberger opposing that, and yet he supported it. His experience didn't prevent him from uh, participating or involving or in some way being involved in the relationship between this government and Mr. Noriega and drug trafficking in Panama. He went to the Philippines in the early 80s and commended Ferdinand Marcos for his commitment to democracy. And he continues to support a failed policy in Central America, which is getting worse and worse, and which has, in fact, increased Cuban and Soviet influence in that region. So I don't believe that the fact that you've uh, got that long resume or, or had that experience uh, uh, is the real question. The question is values. The question is strength. The question is your willingness to provide the kind of leadership that must be provided. I'm ready to provide that leadership. I want to be the commander in chief of this country. I think it takes fresh leadership now and an understanding of those forces of change to provide the kind of strength that we need. And uh, perhaps the vice president can explain what he was doing when he supported the trading of arms to a terrorist nation and his involvement in Panama and that endorsement of Mr. Marcos. But uh, I don't think it's just experience that makes a difference. It's strength and values. Well, I thought the question was about defense. The governor was for a nuclear freeze that would have locked in a, so a thousand Soviet uh, intermediate nuclear force weapons and zero for the West. And because we didn't listen to the freeze advocates and strengthened the defenses of this country, mm -hmm. we now have the first arms control agreement in the nuclear age. Now we're sitting down and talking to the Soviets about a strategic arms, and he wants to do away with the midget man in the MX, the modernization of our nuclear, uh, nuclear capability. That is not the way you deal with the Soviets. I've met Mr. Gorbachev, met Mr. Shevardnadze, and talked substance with him the other day. These people are tough, but now we have a chance if we have the experience and know how to handle it. But please do not go back to the days when the military was as weak as they could be, when the morale was down, and we were, when we were the laughing stock around the world. And now we are back because we have strengthened the defenses of this country. And believe me, I don't want to see us return to those days. As to Ferdinand Mark, is he in there anymore? It was under our administration that Mrs. Mm -hmm. Aquino came in. But I'll tell you what I was thinking of. I flew a combat mission. My last one was over Manila. And he was down there fighting Gosh. against imperialism. And he had just Vice lifted President. martial law. And he Mr. had just Vice. called for new elections. And all of those things Mr. happened Vice. because the Philippines do crave democracy. And he Mr. Vice President, corrupt, out he goes. Mr. Vice President, your time is up. John, a question for the Vice President. Mr. Vice President, the governor has suggested that you've never met a weapons system that you didn't like or want. Are you prepared to tell the voters one system in this time of tight budgetary restraints and problems at the Pentagon that you'd be willing to cut or even eliminate that wouldn't endanger national security? I don't think it's a question of eliminating. I can tell him some I'm against. A6F, for example, DVOD, and I can go on and on. Minuteman three penetration systems. I mean, there's plenty of them that I oppose. But what I am not going to do when we are negotiating with the Soviet Union, sitting down talking to Mr. Gorbachev about how we achieve a 50% reduction in our strategic weapons, I'm not going to give away a couple of aces in that very tough card game. I'm simply not going to do that. And under me, when I lead this country, the Secretary of Defense is going to have to make the choices between how we keep, how we uh, protect the survivability of our, uh, of our nuclear weapons. We are going to make some changes and some tough choices before we go to deployment on the Midget Man missile or on the, on the uh, Minute Man, whatever it is. We're going to have to, the MX, MX, we're going to have to do that. It's Christmas. It's Christmas. <laughs> it's Christmas. <laughs> Wouldn't well, it be nice Christmas, to be perfect? Wouldn't it be nice to decision? be the Iceman so you never make a mistake? The, these are the, these are the, uh, these are the, my answer is do not make these unilateral cuts. And everybody now realizes that peace through strength works. And so this is where I have a big difference. Of course, we're going to have to make some determination on this. And we're going to have to make it on uh, conventional forces. But now we've got a very good concept called competitive strategies. We will do what we do best. It's a strategy that we've been working on for a couple of years. It is going to take us uh, to a much better advantage in conventional forces. But look, let me sum it up. I want to be the president that gets conventional forces in balance. I want to be the one to banish 
chemical and biological weapons from the face of the earth. But you have to have a little bit of experience to know where to start. And I think I've had that. Governor? Well, first, let me say with respect to the freeze that back in the spring of 1982, Mr. Bush was a lot more sympathetic to the freeze than he seems to be today. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, he said it was not and should not be a subject of partisan demagoguery because it was too important to the United States uh, or for the world. I didn't hear, John, exactly wh where he was going to cut and what he was going to do, but I know this. Uh, we have serious financial problems in this country. We've piled up uh, over a trillion dollars in debt, and the next president of the United States is going to have to make some choices. Mr. Bush wants to spend billions on Star Wars. He apparently wants to spend uh, billions on the MX on railroad cars, uh, a weapon system we don't need and can't afford. I thought the administration was opposed to the midget man. I thought the administration was at the negotiating table in Geneva suggesting that we ban mobile missile systems entirely. But those are the choices the next president of the United States is going to have to make. I'm for the stealth, I'm for the D-5, I'm for going ahead with the advanced cruise missile. But I don't think we need these other systems. I don't think we need them to remain strong. We've got to move ahead with the strategic arms negotiation process with a comprehensive Governor. test ban treaty and Governor. with negotiations leading to conventional force reduction in Europe with Here. deeper cuts on the Soviet side. And Senator Benson and I will pursue that policy. Ann Grower, a question for the Vice President. Well, Mr. Vice President, you said you've met with Secretary General Gorbachev, you have uh, met with Mr. Shevardnadze, uh, but for the last 40 years, uh, Americans have been taught to regard the Soviet Union as the enemy. Yet President Reagan has signed two arms control treaties, and he's promised to share Star Wars technology with the very country he once called the evil empire. So perhaps you could tell us this evening, should we be doing a lot to help the economics and, and the social development of a country that we have so long regarded as an adversary? What I think we ought to do is take a look at Perestroika and, and uh, Glasnost, welcome them, but keep our eyes open. Be cautious, because uh, the Soviet change is not fully established yet. Yes, I think it's fine to do business with them. But I don't want to see us exporting our highly sensitive national security or security oriented technology to the Soviet Union. I don't want to see us making unilateral cuts in our strategic systems while we are negotiating with them. And so I'm encouraged by what I see when I talk to Mr. Gorbachev, what I hear when I talk to Mr. Gorbachev and Mr. Shevardnadze. But can they pull it off? And when they have a, they have a deals that are good for us, as China started to do. Uh, the changes in China since Barbara and I lived there are absolutely amazing in terms of incentive and partnerships and things of this nature. And now the Soviet Union seems to be walking down that same path. We should encourage that. We ought to say this is good. But where I differ with my opponent is I am not going to make unilateral cuts in our strategic defense systems or support some freeze when they have superiority. I'm not going to do that because I think the jury is still out on the Soviet experiment. And the interesting place, one of the things that fascinates me about this perestroika and, and glasnost is what's gonna happen in Eastern, Eastern Europe. Uh, you see the turmoil in, in Poland today. And I think we have enormous opportunity for trade. I don't wanna go back to the Carter grain embargo on the Soviets. We are once again reliable suppliers and I would never use food as a political tool like our predecessors did. But this is an exciting time. But all I'm suggesting is let's not be naive in dealing with the Soviets and make a lot of unilateral cuts, hoping against hope that they will, they will match our bid. Look at the INF Treaty. And if we haven't learned from the negotiating history on that, we'll Vice never President. learn. The freeze people were wrong. Vice the Reagan-Bush administration was right. Excuse me. Governor Dukakis. Well, it was a very different George Bush who was talking much more sympathetically about the freeze in the spring of 1982 than he is today. And you were right then, George, when you said that it was no time for partisan demagoguery. Nobody is suggesting that we unilaterally disarm or somehow reduce our strength. Of course not. What we're talking about is a combination of a strong and effective and credible nuclear deterrent, strong, well-equipped, well-trained, well-maintained conventional forces, and at the same time, a willingness to move forward steadily, thoughtfully, cautiously. We have serious differences with the Soviet Union. We have very fundamental differences about human rights, and democracy, and, and our basic system, our basic view of, of human beings and of what life is all about. But there are opportunities there now. Senator Benson and I have a plan for the 1990s and beyond. Uh, Mr. Bush and Mr. Quayle do not. 
And we want to pursue that plan in a way which will bring down the level of nuclear armament, will build a more stable and a more peaceful world, and we can do so while making choices here at home. Let's not forget that our national security and our economic security go hand in hand. We cannot be strong militarily when we're teeter-tottering on top of a mountain of debt which has been created in the past eight years. That's why we need a Democratic administration in Washington in 1989. And Roar, a question for the governor. Yes, Governor Dukakis, uh, speaking of seeming changes of position, you have, have gone from calling the Strategic Defense Initiative or Star Wars uh, a fantasy and a fraud to saying recently you would continue SDI research and might even deploy the system if Congress supported such a move. Why the change of heart? No, there's been no change of heart. I've said from the beginning that we ought to continue research uh, into the strategic system at about the level it was at in 1983. That's about a billion dollars a year. But I don't know of uh, any reputable scientists who uh, believe that this system, at least as originally conceived, could possibly work this notion of some kind of a astrodome over ourselves that could protect us from enemy attack uh, makes uh, real sense and as a matter of fact the system that the administration is now talking about is very different from the one that was originally proposed in 1983 uh, so i'm for continued research but i also want strong conventional forces now the other day mr bush said well if we continued with star war star wars would have to cut someplace he hasn't told us where. We know where they're cutting. We know where you're cutting right now. You're cutting into the fiber and muscle of our conventional forces. You're cutting back on maintenance and equipment. There's an Air Force general not too long ago in Europe who said that pretty soon we'd have airplanes without engines. Uh, tank commanders who can't drive their tanks more than three-quarters of a mile because they don't have enough fuel. Coast Guard cutters tied up at the dock this summer, not patrolling. They're supposed to be our first line of defense against drugs and the war against drugs because they don't have enough fuel. Uh, you have to make choices. We're not making those choices. And to spend billions and billions of dollars, as uh, Mr. Bush apparently wants to, although he himself has been all over the lot on this issue lately. On Star Wars, uh, in my judgment, uh, makes no sense at all. Uh, we need a strong, credible, effective nuclear deterrent. We have 13,000 strategic nuclear warheads right now on land, on sea, and in the air, enough to blow up the Soviet Union 40 times over. They have about 12,000. So we've got to move forward with those negotiations, get the level of strategic weapons down. But to continue to commit billions to this system uh, makes no sense at all. And I think Mr. Bush has been reconsidering his position over the course of the past few weeks. Less, at least that's what I read. Maybe he'll tell us where he stands on it tonight. Mr. Vice President. I'm not reconsidering my position. Two questions. How do you deter nuclear attack without modernizing our nuclear forces when the Soviets are modernizing? And how come you spend willing to spend a dime on something that you consider a fantasy and a fraud? Those are two uh, hyper-rhetorical questions. He is the man on conventional forces that wants to eliminate two carrier battle groups. The armed forces, the conventional forces of the United States have never been more ready. Every single one of the Joint Chiefs will testify to the fact that readiness is at an historic high. And secondly, in terms of the cutting of the Coast Guard, it was the Congress, the Democratic-controlled Congress, so please help us with that, who cut $70 million from the Coast Guard out of the interdiction effort on narcotics. He's got to get this thing more clear. Why do you spend a billion dollars on something you think is a fantasy and a fraud? I will fully research it, go forward as fast as we can. We've set up the levels of funding, and when it is deployable, I will deploy it. That's my position on Peter, SDI, and it's never wavered a bit. Peter Jennings, a question for Governor Dukakis. Well, Governor and Vice President Bush, you've both talked tonight about hard choices. Let me try to give you one. Somewhere in the Middle East tonight, nine Americans are being held hostage. If you are commander-in-chief and Americans are held hostage, what will be more important to you, their individual fate, their individual fate, or the commitment that the United States government must never negotiate with terrorists? And if any Americans are held hostage and you become president, to what lengths would you go to rescue them? Peter, it's one of the most agonizing decisions a president has to make. These are American citizens. We care deeply about them. Their families care deeply about them, uh, want them back, and understandably so, and we want to do everything we can to bring them back. But if there's one thing we also understand, it is that you cannot make concessions to terrorists. Ever. Ever. 
because if you do, it's an open invitation to other terrorists to take hostages and to blackmail us. And that's the tragedy of the Iran-Contra scandal. As a matter of fact, uh, Mr. Bush was the chairman of a task force in international terrorism, which issued a report shortly before that decision was made and said, and rightly so, that we never ever can make concessions to terrorists and hostage takers. And yet after sitting through meeting after meeting, he endorsed that decision, endorsed the sale of arms to the Ayatollah in exchange for hostages. One of the most tragic, one of the most mistaken foreign policy decisions we've ever made in this country, and I dare say encouraged others to take hostages as we now know. So there can be no concessions under any circumstances, because if we do, it's an open, open invitation to others to do the same. We've got to be tough on international terrorism. We've got to treat it as international crime. We've got to attack it at all points. We've got to use undercover operations. We have to be prepared to use military force against terrorist base camps. We have to work closely with our allies to make sure that they're working with us and we with them. And we can give no quarter when it comes to breaking the back of international terrorism. Yes, we should make every effort to try to help those hostages come home, but it can never be because we make concessions. That was a tragic mistake that we made, a mistake that Mr. Bush made and others made, and it should never, ever be made again. Mr. Vice President. I wrote the anti-terrorist report for this government. It is the best anti-terrorist report written. Uh, yes, we shouldn't uh, trade arms for hostages, but we have made vast improvements in our anti-terrorism. Now, it's fine to say that sometimes you have to hit base camps, but when the president saw this state-sponsored fingerprints of Muammar Gaddafi on the loss of American life, he hit Libya. And my opponent was unwilling to support that action. And since that action, that's, that's terrorists, that's uh, true, terrorist true. action against the United States true. citizens have gone down. And uh, I have long ago said I supported the president on this other matter. And I've said mistakes were made. Clearly, nobody's going to think the president started out thinking he was going to trade arms for hostages. That is a very serious charge against the president. That matter's been thoroughly looked into. But the point is, sometimes the, the action has to be taken by the federal government. And uh, when we took action, it had a favorable response. A question for the vice president, Peter. It seems uh, perhaps a good subject, Mr. Vice President, on which to uh, make the point that you've campaigned vigorously as part of a leadership team. But so far, you won't tell the American people in considerable measure what advice you gave the president on issues, yeah. including the sale of arms to Iran and what should have been done about the hostages. To the best of my knowledge, there's no constitutional requirement which prevents you from doing so. Jimmy Carter urged his vice president, Walter Mondale, to tell the American people. Would you now ask President Reagan for permission to tell the American people what advice you did give him? And if you don't, how do we judge your judgment in the Oval Office in the last eight years? You're judged by the whole record. you judge by the entire record. Are we closer to peace? Are we doing better in anti-terrorism? Should we have listened to my opponent who wanted to send the UN into the Persian Gulf? Or in spite of the mistakes of the past, are we doing better there? How is our credibility with the GCC countries on the western side of the Gulf? Is Iran talking to Iraq about peace? You judge on the record. Are the Soviets coming out of Afghanistan? How does it look in a program he called phony or some one of these marvelous Boston adjectives up there and about uh, Angola? Now we have a chance. Now, several Bostonians don't like it, but the rest of the country will understand. Now we have a chance. Now we have a chance. Now we have a chance. And so uh, I think that uh, I'd leave it right there and say that you judge on the whole record. And let me say this. All he can talk about, he goes around running about Noriega. Now I've told you what the intelligence briefing he received said about that. He can talk about Iran-Contra, and I'll, I'll make a deal with you. I will take all the blame for those two incidents is if you give me half the credit for all the good things that have happened in world peace since Ronald Reagan and I took over from the Carter administration. And, and Peter, I still, I, still have a, I still have a couple of minutes left, and there is a different principle here on sorry, competence. Sorry, Mr. Vice President. It's only on yellow here. Wait a minute. Come I'm on. sorry. I'm wrong. Go ahead. My apologies. 
Oh, Jim, you said nobody's perfect. <laughs> I said I wasn't perfect. Okay. I thought you were. Where was I? My apology. 25th of December, Mr. Mark. <laughs> I finished. Governor. He can have another 10 seconds if he wants, Jim. No, go, yes, sir. Okay. Go ahead. All go right. Ahead. All right. Governor, you have a minute to, uh, to respond. Well, the matter of judgment is very important. And uh, I think it's important to understand what happened here. A report on international terrorism chaired by the Vice President was released and made some very specific rec recommendations about how to deal with terrorism. They were ignored. The Vice President ignored them. He says mistakes were made, very serious mistakes in judgment were made. He says, uh, well, let's concede that the administration has been doing business with Noriega, has made him a part of our foreign policy, and has been funneling aid to the countries who convicted drug dealers. I think those are very, very serious questions of judgment which those of you who are watching us here tonight have a right to judge and review. We're not going to make those kinds of mistakes. You cannot make concessions to terrorists. If you do, you invite the taking of more hostages. That's a basic principle. It was ignored in that case, and uh, it was a very, very serious mistake in judgment. Go to a question from uh, John Mashik. It goes to the Vice President. Mr. Vice President, Democrats and even some Republicans are still expressing reservations about the qualifications and credentials of Senator Dan Quayle of Indiana, your chosen running mate, to be a heartbeat away from the presidency. What do you see in him that others do not? I see a young man that was elected to the Senate twice, to the House of Representatives twice, I see a man who is young, and I am putting my confidence in a whole generation of people that are in their 30s and in their 40s. I see a man that took the leadership in the Job Training Partnership Act, and that retrains people in this highly competitive, changing society we're in, so if a person loses his job, he is retrained for a benefit, uh, for a work that'll uh, be productive, and he won't have to go on one of these many programs that the liberals keep talking about. I see a young man who is knowledgeable in defense. And there are three people on our ticket that are knowledgeable in the whole, in the race, knowledgeable in defense. And Dan Quayle is one of them. And I am one of them. And I believe that he will be outstanding. And he took a tremendous pounding. And everybody now knows that he took a very unfair pounding. And I'd like each person to say, did I jump to conclusions running down rumors that were so outrageous and so brutal? And he's kept his head up. And he will do very, very well. And he has my full confidence, and he'll have the confidence of people that are in their 30s and 40s and more. So judge the man on his record, not on a lot of rumors and innuendo and trying to fool around with his name. My opponent says, J. Danforth Quayle. Do you know who J. Danforth was? He was a man that gave his life in World War II. So ridiculing a person's name is a little beneath this process. And he'll do very well when we get into the debate. Governor? Well, when it comes to ridicule, uh, George, you win a gold medal. I think we can agree on that. <laughs> the of this the facts. But did I... Uh, did I sense a desire that maybe Lloyd Benson ought to be your running mate when you said that three people on your ticket? No, I think the uh, debate ought to be between you I, and I. Uh, I think the American people have a right to judge us on this question, on how we picked our running mate, a person who is a heartbeat away from the presidency. I picked Lloyd Benson, uh, distinguished, strong, mature, a leader in the Senate, somebody whose qualifications nobody has questioned. Mr. Bush picked Dan Quayle. I doubt very much that Dan Quayle was the best qualified person for that job. And as a matter of fact, uh, I think for most people, the notion of President Quayle is a very, very troubling notion tonight. All right, John will now ask a question of the governor. It will be the last question, and then the vice president will have a rebuttal. John? Well, Governor, you did select Lloyd Benson of Texas. I did indeed. And you have a lot of disagreement with him on fundamental issues, including the Reagan tax cuts, 
aid to the rebels in Nicaragua, the death penalty, gun control. Who's right? Well, John, I'm a man that's been a chief executive for 10 years. I've picked a lot of people. I've picked cabinets. I've named judges. Uh, I know that the people you pick make an enormous difference in your ability to govern. And I set high standards. I try to meet them, and I insist that people who work for me meet them. And if they don't, they don't stick around very long. But I didn't pick Lloyd Benson because he was a clone of Mike Dukakis. I picked him because he was somebody who would be a strong vice president, somebody who would be an active vice president. Somebody would come to me if somebody came up with a crazy idea that we ought to trade arms to the Ayatollah for hostages and say, Mr. President, that's wrong. We shouldn't do that. That's the kind of vice president I want. He himself has said, and rightly so, that he'll be a strong vice president, but when the president makes a decision, that will be his decision. But I'm very, very proud of that choice, and I didn't pick him because he agreed with me on everything. You know, Sam Rabin once said that if two people agree on everything, then only one person is doing the thinking. Uh, the fact is that I've picked somebody who not only will be a great vice president, but if, God forbid, something happens to the president, could step into that office and do so with distinction and with strength and with leadership. I doubt very much, I doubt very much that Mr. Bush's selection for the vice presidency of the United States meets that test. Mr. Vice President. Well, I, we obviously have a difference. Uh, I believe it does meet the test. We'll have an opportunity to see the two of them in action in a friendly Wonder. form, wonderful, friendly fashion like, like this. I'd hope that this had, uh, I'd hope this had been a little friendlier in the evening. I'd wanted to hitchhike a ride home in his tank with him, but uh, I think now we're, uh, we got the lines too, too carefully drawn here. But you talk about judgment. I mean, uh, what kind of judgment? I mean, jumping all over the president on his decision on one era of foreign policy? What kind of judgment sends a, has your chief education advisor now in jail in Massachusetts? I mean, there, I don't think this is a fair argument, but nevertheless, I support my nominee for vice president, and he'll do an outstanding job. Gentlemen, I was given some bad word a moment ago. There is time for one more question. <laughs> Getting it in my ear, uh, and Ann Grower will ask it. Ann? Vice President to, to the governor, sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. Governor Dukakis, um, as many U.S. farmers face or undergo foreclosure, the United States is considering the possibility of forgiving a certain percentage of debt owed by Latin American and third world countries. Do you favor giving these countries a break in their loans? And if so, how do you explain that to the American farmers who are losing their land and livelihood? Well, I think we have to go to work on the problem of third world debt, uh, and we've got to assist those third world countries in dealing with this massive debt which they currently, uh, which they have incurred and which is burdening them, and which if we don't do something about it and assist them along with uh, other nations around the world, will we'll destroy their economies, destroy their future, and at the same time, will destroy markets that are important to our farmers. But I also believe that we need an agricultural policy which doesn't cost us the 15 to 20 to 25 billion dollars a year that it's been costing us over the course of the past three or four years under this administration. I think it's going to require good solid credit policies and thanks to the Congress we now have an agricultural credit bill which is helping and uh, improving the situation with at least some of our farmers. I think it's going to require a combination of uh, supply management and reasonable price supports to make sure that our farmers get a, a decent price. And I think it also is going to require an administration that understands that there, that there are tremendous opportunities out there for the development of new uses for agricultural products, new uses which can help us to clean up our environment at the same time. Biodegradable plastic, plastic, uh, gas haul, which the vice president himself has been involved in, uh, road de-ices made from uh, corn products. I mean, there are enormous opportunities out there to expand markets and to build a strong future for our farmers. But I don't think there's anything... Uh, Ex mutually exclusive or contradictory about building a strong farm economy in this country and assisting our family farms and providing a good strong future for rural communities and for rural America and at the same time uh, working on third world debt. As a matter of fact, uh, Mexico itself is one of our biggest agricultural customers. So in the sense that we can work to help Mexico rebuild and expand and, and deal with its very serious economic problems, we help our farmers at the same time. Mr. Vice President. 
I oppose supply management and production controls. Uh, I support the Farm Bill, the 85 Farm Bill, and its spending is moving in the right direction. I want to expand our markets abroad, and that's why I've called for that first economic summit to be on agriculture. I will not go back to the way the Democrats did it and use food as a political weapon and throw a grain embargo on the farmers in this country. I want to see rural redevelopment, and I have been out front in favor of alternate uh, sources of energy, and one of them is gas a haul and comes from uh, using your corn, and I think we can do better in terms of biodegradables for a lot of products. So I'm optimistic about the agricultural economy. In terms of the third world, I support the Baker plan. I want to see market economies spring up all around the world, and to the degree they do, we are succeeding. And I don't want to see the banks let off the hook. I would oppose that, but I think we're on the right track in agriculture, and I am very, very encouraged. But let's not go back to that, what they call supply management and production control. That'll simply price us out of the international market. Let's try to expand our markets abroad. All right, that really is the end. Now let's go to closing statements. There will be, they will be two minutes each in duration by agreement. Vice President Bush goes first, Governor Dukakis second. Mr. Vice President. I talked in New Orleans about a gentler and kinder nation, and I've made specific proposals on education and the environment, on ethics, on energy, and on how we do better in battling crime in our country. But there are two main focal points of this election, opportunity and peace. I want to keep this expansion going. Yes, we want change, but we are the change. I am the change. I don't want to go back to malaise and misery index. And so opportunity, keep America at work. The best poverty program is a job with dignity in the private sector. And in terms of peace, we are on the right track. Uh, we've achieved an arms control agreement that our critics thought was never possible, and I want to build on it. I want to see us finalize that START agreement, and I want to be the one to finally lead the world to banishing chemical and biological weapons. I want to see asymmetrical reductions in conventional forces. And then it gets down to a question of values. We've had a chance to spell out our differences on the Pledge of Allegiance here tonight and on tough sentencing of drug kingpins and this kind of thing. I do favor the death penalty. We've got a wide array of differences on those. But in the final analysis, in the final analysis, person goes into that booting booth, they're going to say, who has the values I believe in? Who has the experience that we trust? Who has the integrity and the stability to get the job done? My fellow Americans, I am that man, and I ask for your support. Thank you very much. Governor. Governor DeCocco. This has been an extraordinary 18 months for Kitty and me and for our family. We've had an opportunity to campaign all over this country to meet with so many of you in communities, states, and regions to get to know you. I'm more optimistic today than I was when I began about this nation, providing we have the kind of leadership in Washington that can work with you, that can build partnerships, that can build jobs in every part of this country, not certain parts of this country. You know, my friends, my parents came to this country as, as immigrants, like millions and millions of Americans before them and since seeking opportunity, seeking the American dream. And they made sure their sons understood that this was the greatest country in the world, that those of us especially who were the sons and daughters of immigrants had a special responsibility to give something back to the country that had opened up its arms to our parents and given so much to them. I believe in the American dream. I'm a product of it. And I want to help that dream come true for every single citizen in this land with a good job at good wages, with good schools in every part of this country, in every community in this country, with decent and affordable housing that our people can buy and own and live in so that we end the shame of homelessness in America, with decent and affordable health care for all working families. Yes, it's a tough problem, as Mr. Bush says, but it's not an insolvable problem. It's one that we will solve and must solve with a clean and wholesome environment. And with a strong America that's strong militarily and economically, as we must be, an America that provides strong international leadership because we're true to our values, we have an opportunity working together to build that future, to build a better America, to build the best America. 
Because the best America doesn't hide, we compete. The best America doesn't waste, we invest. The best America doesn't leave some of its citizens behind, we live, we bring everybody along. And the best America is not behind us. The best America is yet to come. Thank you very much for listening. against the backdrop of a standing ovation here in the chapel at Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And as family members hug the candidates of their choice and then shake hands with their opposite numbers, this first of the presidential campaign debates, or if you prefer joint appearances, or if you prefer orchestrated control news conferences, comes to a close. The early wire service leads dealt with the discussions having to do with how to stop drugs and the spread of drugs in this country and the discussion over the patriotism issue. Governor Dukakis calling for uh, an end to Vice President Bush as Dukakis said questioning his patriotism. Those are among the early morning wire service leads. Now we're going to be here with varying views and perspectives in the wake of this Wake Forest debate for about the uh, next half hour. Joining me now, CBS News correspondent, our chief Washington correspondent, Bob Sheever, who watched the debate here in the hall and uh, watching at the same time nearby, but in the press room, our chief political correspondent, Bruce Morton. First, Bob Sheever, your early impressions and reactions to what happened here tonight. Well, I think there were no knockout blows in this tonight, Dan. Uh, this was uh, an evening when I think both men gave as good as they got. Both men scored some points on various things. It seems to me that if one man or the other gains or loses a great deal out of this evening, it's going to be on how people take the exchange over the Pledge of Allegiance, the card-carrying business. Now, that's the, that's the little routine that George Bush does every day out on the stump. Uh, you got to see it. Uh, he put his uh, best uh, spin on that. Uh, will people say, will they agree with him? Well, wait a minute. He's saying that this guy really is out in left field here. He is out of the mainstream. Or will they uh, get the impression that this is something of a cheap shot, which is basically what Michael Dukakis said tonight. He said, look, don't let anybody kid you here. This guy's questioning my patriotism. I think the way people judge in their own minds that exchange will have a great deal to do with who gains the most out of this debate. George Bush uh, got the biggest laugh tonight when he said that uh, uh, one of Dukakis's answers was uh, as clear as Boston Harbor. Most of the time, the Bush partisans inside the hall here tonight uh, were more demonstrative than the Dukakis people. And that'll be one of the unfortunate footnotes about it because it did take up time, whether it was uh, Dukakis supporters or, or Bush supporters taking up time with the applause, which Jim Lehrer did a very good job of, of imploring them not to do, but they did anyway. Let's go to Bruce Morton. Bruce, uh, from where you sat watching this uh, on television, uh, the highs and lows and how you think it'll play? Well, I agree with Bob about a lot of it, Dan. I think uh, nobody introduced any bold new proposals tonight, and the debater's handbook says you're not supposed to introduce bold new proposals in these things. You're supposed to say what you've said before. So uh, if there was a winner on specifics, it might be Governor Dukakis. He had a few more of them. But my suspicion is that viewers don't really judge on who said exactly what about missiles or trade. They, they judge on what they can read of the man. Uh, we saw one fairly rare glimpse of a really, I thought, angry Dukakis, as Bob said, when he said, of course George Bush has been questioning my patriotism. Of course he has, and I resent it. We saw George Bush uh, fall into some momentary confusion over which missile he really had in mind and rescue himself fairly gracefully, I thought, by saying, uh, wouldn't it be nice to be the Iceman? Wouldn't it be nice to be perfect all the time? So uh, if he had a reputation for sometimes putting a foot wrong, he, he handled that well, I think. The other thing that struck me, Dan, is that these two men don't like each other very much. By the end of the evening, 
it was pretty clear that Dukakis had resented uh, Mr. Bush's attempts to make him Jimmy Carter or some far out left wing liberal. And it was pretty clear that uh, Mr. Bush resented some of the things of uh, Dukakis had said about him, that line about, of course, you're impugning my patriotism, for instance. So uh, we've established a little dislike, and uh, maybe we'll add to that to uh, come around too. Very quickly, Bob Schieffer, what's your lead? If you had to write for a morning newspaper, what would the lead be? No knockdown. Bruce? I think that's right. And when we come back, we'll take a look at the so-called spin patrols, the representatives of each of the two candidates, and what they're doing, how they're trying to cast the reaction to this debate. So stay here with us. This is CBS. My place is famous for fresh seafood, thanks. So when Louis Kemp walked in here and told me his new crab delights are better than crab, it sounded like a fish story to me. But once I tried them, I was hooked. Louis was right. Crab delights have the delicious taste of crab, but they're better because they're made from steam baked Alaskan whitefish. So they're lower in fat and cholesterol. The great taste of crab. But crab delights cost a lot less. New crab delights from Louis Kemp. They are better than crab. Louis Kemp made a believer out of me. Now at Dairy Queen, it's the DQ Homestyle Ultimate. We start with a juicy homestyle patty, add melted cheese, and yet another homestyle patty. Then we top it off with our own tasty sauce, savory bacon, ripe tomatoes, and fresh lettuce, too. You can see why it's the ultimate taste. Try one today. You won't want to miss it. The new DQ Homestyle Ultimate. We treat you right. Join us for a complete look at news, weather, and sports tonight at 10 on KX4 News. CBS News coverage of the Wake Forest debate continues. Here again is Dan Rather. At least some cases from two candidates and certainly the longest, most sustained look we've had at them and the first look we've had at them side by side, face to face on the stage, same stage for an extended period of time. Now we mentioned uh, before we went to the commercial that we'd be coming in and seeing how each of the candidates' forces are going to try to cast this thing and Leslie Stahl is still gathering her information about that. So we're going to shift gears for just a moment and tell you that we've had our CBS News correspondents David Martin and Robert Kruwich standing by uh, in New York to take a look at the facts that each of the candidates